Thank you very much and good evening, everybody. I think if we um, look um, at this phenomenon of transnational terrorism, and particularly Islamist terrorism, for the last decade it's been framed very much uh, in terms of the security preoccupations of the developed world and uh, predominantly Western countries. Um, that's not, it's not, I'm not saying that uh, the, these concerns are, are misplaced or have gone away, but of course these are the countries that are by definition best equipped to deal with problems of this kind and have to a significant degree done so. And I would, uh, I would say in parenthesis that uh, um, notwithstanding all the furore that there has been in recent months over the revelations by um, NSA contractor Edward Snowden, um, we, we are at risk of forgetting that the intelligence generated from some of these NSA programs has been a resource that has been available to the planet as a whole, not just for the um, benefit of the security of the United States and its most immediate allies. But although we've focused on this threat in terms of preoccupations about the you know, the security of the developed world, the, the action now is actually in the developing world. If you look at the statistics, they are very telling. In the past year, 2012, um, some 8,500 terrorist attacks, 15,500 uh, uh, people killed, uh, considerably greater numbers injured, all within really about eight countries, uh, Afghanistan, you know, Pakistan, Iraq, you know, Nigeria, Yemen, um, and you know, um, all, all within you know, the developing world, and that is where the action is. And this fragmentation of um, jihadism, of al-Qaeda, for, for, you know, to use a shorthand uh, term that has uh, taken place, is very much uh, playing through in, in, into this agenda. We look at um, where these groups are now asserting themselves, exploiting um, ungoverned space and uh, absence of effective governance and security mechanisms. Uh, we, we see that uh, the Al-Qaeda jihadist ideology is an ideology that's very flexible in terms of its capacity to attach itself to local issues, local grievances, and, and create um, some kind of connecting thread. Now, you know, I'm not going to go through the alphabet soup of uh, different uh, jihadist groups that have uh, emerged in various parts of the Sahel, North Africa, and uh, the Levant, and Shashank will talk uh, about what uh, we're seeing in South Asia, so I won't do that. But I think there are some important questions that, that arise here. To what extent is all of this you know, if, uh, connected or coordinated, if at all? And I think the answer is, uh, to a degree, at a top level, it probably is. Um, we're seeing, for example, evidence of Al-Qaeda Central um, attempting to um, establish um, footholds and connectivity in locations like Libya, in locations like Syria, with much less success. But in a sense, it almost really doesn't matter because you know, what, what is happening is you know, really... Um, a phenomenon that, that um, you know, is, is currently favorable to um, you know, jihadism as an ideology, as a concept. Um, we're seeing um, footholds being established in, in a number of different places. How that will play out remains to be seen, and I suspect over time jihadism you know, carries within itself the seeds of its own destruction, but until that happens, um, we're probably in for quite a lot of pain. But one or two things you know, worth highlighting. Firstly, I think the um, jihadist narrative is becoming more sophisticated, the delivery vectors are becoming more sophisticated, and collectively, uh, the governments uh, of the world are having very little success in combating it. Secondly, I think what we're at risk of seeing is a kind of competitive upbidding in which uh, different groups um, look at what the last lot did and tell themselves they've got to do something more spectacular and uh, with greater impact in order to um, raise their threshold. And there is a degree of internal competitiveness here at work. You know, it's not about coordination. It's about you know, 
um, competition, really. Um, and the third thing is that in certain parts of the world, and this is particularly evident in places like Yemen and Libya, we're seeing some very sophisticated uh, counterintelligence uh, activities being undertaken by jihadist groups um, focusing on assassinations of key um, in, uh, counterterrorism and security officials and increasingly you know, their, um, their families. Um, so um, you know, the, um, the, the stage, I think, is set for uh, considerable instability. And for Western countries, I think this poses a very significant challenge. You know, um, states like the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, face a really serious dilemma now. Do they intervene directly in some of these conflicts? Do they um, engage in capacity building? Capacity building can be very uh, effective if done well, but if done badly, can be downright counterproductive. In the very worst cases, you end up with Los Zetas, um, the Kabiles in Honduras, or the Mali army, as was. Um, so um, you know, there, there are, I think, for, for Western states, some, some real challenges here about how you actually um, deal, you know, to, to what extent do you engage um, directly in some of these conflicts, um, and you know, if so, how do you do it? Definitively, uh, there's a new picture, and, and uh, definitively the nature of Al-Qaeda is changing, and you have some kind of decentralization, perhaps symbolized uh, by the person of Ayman al sawiri you know, in one sense coming in from the periphery. Uh, my main research interest is indeed Harakat al-Shabaab, and also the resurfacing of several jihadist groups within Africa. And I think uh, one of the weaknesses that perhaps we are facing is a more, uh, it's our old habit, habitual thinking about uh, terrorist groups, uh, jihadist groups, as consisting of small cells operating independently in a clandestinely in an environment that's ought to hunt them and where you have a police force who's actually functioning. Uh, in Africa, what you see is uh, organizations with the territorial control. Uh, and you have uh, organizations with semi-territorial control. Organizations with territorial control are facing a lot of uh, possibilities and difficulties that uh, other organizations uh, don't encounter. Basically, to be a jihadi in Africa can be quite profitable. That's something we should keep in mind. 25 million US dollars from uh, coal trade in Kismayo, uh, in taxation, that's what they say Shebab earns fr from, from that business. You will have export of cigarettes, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, controlling the uh, smuggling highways between North and South in Sahara. So there are several examples of that, that you can have some kind of profitability. And when you have territorial uh, control and profitability, you will also recruit amongst people that perhaps you won't recruit amongst in the West. You know, uh, Shebab, for all uh, its, uh, its faults, you know, it can give stable employment in parts of Somalia. Uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in some par uh, parts of uh, Algeria and in some uh, parts of Maghreb can give a stable income. So they can recruit basically opportunists, but they will be put through a process of indoctrination very often. And the question is where that leads to. And that also opens up some other questions about poverty and radicalization that perhaps in the West, for example, you can envisage a small cell operating with dedicated fanatics because, uh, you know, uh, poverty is not so rampant here. That's the first uh, issue. The second issue is that there are alternative sources of income. But in Somalia, for example, you can face a dedicated Sheba fighter who fights out of loyalty because they, somebody has been providing him an income for several years. And, and that's the case we are facing when it comes to uh, organizations with territorial and, and, and semi-territorial control. And in one sense, it's illustrated by the very strange uh, encounters in Somalia, some very strange things happening, like Al-Qaeda getting into development aid and humanitarian aid. You know, this is quite strange. Just because Shebab is their affiliate and, and Shebab is doing these things, you know, and they want foreign support, and then you suddenly see Al-Qaeda during drought coming in and, and supplying uh, food. Very, very strange and very special. So this is something we should, uh, sh should keep in mind. And it gives us some possibilities, and it gives us some challenges. You know, these organizations will definitely be vulnerable to some kind of ethnic hijacking. 
there might be ethnic or tribal or clanist manipulations of the organization, and the organization will very often try to manipulate uh, such entities in return, which gives us possibilities, but also can create uh, loyalty locally. And we should keep in mind that this doesn't mean that there won't be an ideological element to it. So these two things can coexist. A certain view of local politics can coexist with a certain view of the UMA as something under threat. It can coexist with a view that this should be uh, international uh, unification because it's simply very far in the future. So when you examine these organizations, you really have to look into a set of traits rather than one trait. And these traits, ideological traits within these various organizations, they can be quite common to us, not unexpected. You know, as I said, you know, the belief that you have some kind of umma under threat and uh, that you need to fight some kind of defensive jihad to protect it can coexist with other interesting traits that we should be aware of. Like the idea that basically Sharia produces a very good alternative to corrupt uh, governments and, and uh, lack of governance and justice. And this is something that you can observe in, in Mali and it's something you can observe in Somalia. Basically that uh, you lack governance and you expect the religious authorities to take upon that governance because you expect people that believe in Sharia to follow Sharia and really be uh, thorough in implementing Sharia. And then you have the expectation that Sharia is better than no law. So this is something we should uh, be aware of, that, that, that we should take with us and, 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 and keep in mind. That they, you know, sometimes in, uh, in their propaganda they will see, say that they provide some kind of alternative. In some, if, uh, in some cases, like in Kenya, you can see this uh, propaganda even being used uh, when you have an existing state, when there are state structure, structures. Yeah, the different actors trying to, to uh, depict Islam as some kind of alternative to the corrupt state structures. And of course, that's the second challenge that is uh, when it comes to Africa, that our local partners don't necessarily function the way we, we, we want them to. You know, giving advantages to the various radical organizations, giving advantages to the Shabab, for example, when there's a Somali police was unpaid for three years and started to pillage, this was heavily used by uh, Shabab in, in their propaganda. So it gives propaganda advantages. It gives far more than that. If you look at the, the uh, various pictures coming out of the West Gate after the attack, you see how, uh, you know, Kenyan uh, Defense Forces soldiers carrying out plastic bags from, from the shopping mall. So it basically weakens our local allies and the abilities to do intelligence operations, it weakens the abilities to control uh, persons traveling in the area and it weakens the abilities to, to uh, control weapons because the, these police forces are much more easily bribable. So again, you have a, a new set of opportunities uh, for, for the jihadists and uh, you have a new basis that can be used to train a new, uh, a new generation of jihadists. You have a new basis that can be used to really maintain some kind of propaganda effort. And this is also something we should think about because so far we expected the propaganda effort targeting United Kingdom, targeting the West as emerging out of maybe Al-Qaeda Central, Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, these actors. What we can see now is that uh, you know, organizations like the Shebab is basically putting up quite a good propaganda show. You know, no recently, the last autumn, uh, Shebab producing a video, propaganda video on the Woolwich murders, you know, uh, Shebab uh, commenting upon uh, things that goes on in Denmark, uh, Shebab trying to do free, uh, create free movers, people, people acting independently you know, without being in touch with the Shebab organization. And this is something we should be aware of when it comes to Africa. With the Shebab and perhaps Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, they are the strongest actors. You know, Boko Haram produces videos, but they are still a little bit special. New bases to sort of older bases in South Asia, and that's, that's where I'll focus. I'm, I don't have the terrorism special, special, specialism of the, uh, my other two speakers, but what I will talk about is how this issue uh, changing Islamic terrorism is viewed both, it, it exists in South Asia, but is also viewed from South Asia. So South Asian capitals, notably Delhi, but also places like Kabul and Islamabad. And it's an interesting time to do this because uh, some of you will have seen that the, the Foreign Office research analysts recently started publishing some declassified papers, some of their pieces of analysis. One of the first ones was why we should stop using the term Al-Qaeda core, which, which alludes to issues that Nigel and, and Stig have both discussed, the issues of Al-Qaeda's changing center of gravity away from those bases in what was called AFPAC, briefly Afghanistan, Pakistan, <clears throat> and westwards towards the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa. 
according to some of the estimates we have from military sources inside Afghanistan, there are somewhere around 75 members of al-Qaeda left within Afghanistan, probably far fewer than that. Um, what I would say is the lens through which Islamic militancy is being viewed in South Asia today is probably above all the drawdown of US forces next year. That's the issue that is framing many of the debates taking place around uh, uh, where Islamic terrorism is going, both in uh, Pakistan, which is, of course will bear the, uh, bear the brunt of this withdrawal, or drawdown, I should say, uh, India, where it's viewed with considerable alarm, Afghanistan, where the uh, lawyer Jirga con uh, convened by Hamid Karzai has pleaded with him uh, to sign the bilateral security agreement with the United States, and he in turn has played, continued his game of chicken. But that is the issue, I think, that frames how people are looking at issues of Islamic terrorism, not just to do with al-Qaeda, also to do with Lashkar-e Taiba, the TTP, and the various other uh, alphabet soup of militants that exists in that uh, uh, broader South Asian area. So just to begin with Pakistan, Stig talked about territorial control, uh, groups that have territorial control versus those that don't. He talked about profitability. I think in Pakistan, with respect to all of its principal groups, both pro-Islamabad, pro-state, and anti-state, we see that in buckets. They have strong territorial control, whether that's the TTP in the tribal areas, uh, or whether that's Lashkari Taiba with its considerable base, social base, political base, in the heartland of Pakistan, the Punjab. Um, the TTP is a, is a very interesting... Uh, uh, group to look at just now because it, it, I think, raises some of these questions about the changing nature of uh, Islamic terrorism. The TTP have recently had their leader, Haki Mullah Massoud, killed in a drone strike a few weeks ago. And the Pakistani response to his death, I think, signified this enormous confusion over how they should be dealing with these groups. Uh, there was um, uh, enormous anger at the United States for violating Pakistani sovereignty. There was uh, very little sense of um, uh, uh, happiness that the Americans had taken out someone who had inflicted such a uh, huge toll on Pakistani civilians in the Pakistani state. Um, and it torpedoed the newly elected government's vision of holding talks with the TTP, holding talks with a terrorist organization that has killed so many Pakistanis. So I think the Pakistani state is still coming to terms with how to deal with this. The new army chief, who has just been announced today to succeed General Kayani, uh, did a great deal to, to pivot Pakistan's focus away from, uh, away from India and towards the internal challenge from the TTP, but I still think there, are, there, are, there is a, a deep sense of ambivalence over how the Pakistani state ought to be dealing with this group that does have connections to al-Qaeda, that has, of course, attempted attacks abroad in the Times Square attack, and uh, so on. You're also seeing uh, the TTP work more and more with sectarian groups inside Pakistan, groups like Lashkari Jangvi the, the, uh, and others who are massacring Pakistani uh, Shia uh, in very large numbers indeed. And that nexus is something that is, is of, of uh, real concern. Those sectarian groups also have their own ties uh, to al-Qaeda within, within Pakistan. So there are increasing connections between those types of groups. Uh, and finally, you have... Uh, potential fragmentation within Pakistani militant groups. In the last month or so, we have seen a spate of killings of members of the Haqqani network. The Haqqani network being uh, an Afghan insurgent group that is uh, formally uh, uh, technically part of the Afghan insurgency. It was described two years ago memorably by Admiral Mike Mullen, who was then the top US Army officer as uh, a veritable arm of the ISI. So it's a group that has historically worked closely with Pakistani intelligence. And now there are increasing suggestions that the Pakistani Taliban and the Haqqani network may be at each other's throats. So there are interesting realignments within the insurgent nexus, uh, um, the insurgent uh, spectrum taking place within Pakistan. And the drawdown of US forces from Afghanistan is accelerating that sense of uncertainty as to what will, what will happen. Will insurgents be pushed into Pakistan? Will they stay within Afghanistan? Uh, will Afghan forces uh, take matters into their own hands? We saw reports a few weeks ago that the uh, Afghan intelligence services, the NDS, was working with uh, a senior TTP, a Pakistani Taliban leader, to use against Pakistan. So the drawdown has introduced all of these uncertainties into the mix, and that is having uh, an, an interesting effect within Pakistan. Um, Shashank, you have about a minute. I have about a minute left. Um, I was going to say a lot on India, but I... 
I've clearly used up all my time on Pakistan. So on India, I'll just make a very brief point, which is from the Indian point of view, the drawdown is, is uh, of considerable concern because they see the prospect of fighters moving back into Kashmir as they did after the Soviet withdrawal at the end of the 1980s. But they also look at al-Qaeda within Pakistan and a phenomenon that Steve Tankel recently called the Pakistan Pakistanization of al-Qaeda, that is Pakistani nationals taking leadership positions within al-Qaeda, uh, working with groups like Lashkari Taiba within Pakistan, working with indigenous Indian groups like the Indian Mujahideen. So finally, the more we look at the changing center of gravity of al-Qaeda, look at it as moving away from South Asia, uh, it, it does not mean these challenges have diminished in any way for the countries within the region uh, where this is still very, very uh, uh, active indeed.